Welcome to the Apartment Investor Show, where we help you get smart and invest smarter in multifamily real estate. I'm your host, Jason Castillo, founder and managing principal of the Multifamily Property Group. And joining me as always is my good buddy, my co-host, the godfather of lending, Mr. Paul Peebles, national underwriter for Old Capital Lending. Paulie, how are you feeling today? Boy, I am feeling pretty good. It's a beautiful, hot summer day in the middle of June here. And uh, I just came back from a lunch that was outside. And that one of the things I did notice that uh, I think Texas is starting to come back where the servers are not wearing gloves and they're not wearing masks. And, uh, you know, I think it's starting to, to kind of feel like the normal days. And there are certain areas of the country that don't feel like the normal days. And this is kind of an exception up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but it definitely kind of feels more, more back to normal if that's a if that's a phrase. So, uh, uh, yeah, so doing well. So, and you're doing okay, Jason? Oh, Polly, things things are great. You know, Polly, if we if we kind of just take a snapshot and we go back in time about three months ago, and we 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 kind of think back to sort of late March as we were all sheltering in place. And sort of in the multifamily space, all of us operators and owners were really preparing for the worst. Um, and, and I got to say, over the last three months, and this is not just what we've seen uh, personally with our company, but if you look at the national stats, you can see that the rental collections have actually stayed almost fairly consistent to what we were collecting before um, uh, before the, the uh, pandemic hit, um, especially in, some, in markets like Dallas-Fort Worth. And so... I think really what what I'm excited to to talk about today is is I'm excited to talk about the fact that yes you know it's really been a lot better uh, in, in fact unbelievably great if you compare what we expected to what's happening but I think that we really are starting to think about what's happening in the second half of the year what's going to happen and so I thought that it would be a very timely uh, opportunity to bring uh, one of our um, very favorite um, analytics uh, people to the show to really give some predictions about um, what we're calling is, how is the post-pandemic, yes, people, we are calling it (laughs) post-pandemic, how is the post-pandemic economy going to impact uh, multifamily uh, in 2020 with some specific reference to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, but we'll also talk about the the macro perspective. So um, Paul Hendershot um, of CoStar, really welcome to the show and thanks for joining. No, thank you. And, um, you know, I'm glad you made that bold prediction that we have, I was going to say pivoted, kind of give it a push, but I like the fact that we are in a post-pandemic economy. I appreciate that. So, you know, Paul, I think that, um, you know, having, having, having talked about sort of the, the goodness that we've seen over the last three months, I think what's really important to, to understand here is that, you know, um, we also have, have seen a lot of uh, government stimulus and a lot of um, you know uh, unemployment benefits going out there. And so what I want to talk about today is what's going to happen sort of moving forward and what do you predict? And one of the biggest things I think we need to focus on is jobs. I mean, jobs, as you know, uh, really drive the ability of our, of our residents to, to make their, 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 their rent and for us to actually have collections. So um, why don't you talk a little bit about the, the job market uh, and in the unemployment market from not only from a Dallas Fort Worth perspective, but also from sort of a national perspective. Okay. And um, you're, you're right. We have seen a tremendous level of stimulus activity enacted by both Congress and the Fed to really help bolster this economy in this time of need. So I'm going to throw a few numbers at you. Um, but we just for a sense of scale, in January of 2020, the Metroplex had a labor force of 4 million people. We employed about 3.8 million people, and that gave us that unemployment rate of 3.3%. We were truly one of the bright spots of the U.S. economy. We were adding approximately 100,000 jobs a year um, across all industry sectors, leading the nation. Um, So let's fast forward to today. Uh, The latest data for April uh, has our labor force shrinking to 3.6 million people. So essentially that's a that's a lot of folks that are either they're not able to they're not only not able to find a job, they cannot even look for a job. Uh, those are those discouraged workers. They're they, you know, the shelter in orders and other other factors have essentially taken these folks out of the labor force. And so that leaves us with 3.2 million folks employed. Now, 
this is so if you just kind of reverse those, you know, let's look at those numbers. We we went from 3.8 million to 3.2 million folks creating economic activity. That's that's about 600,000 folks that are no longer generating just out and about buying stuff. They don't have any more money in their pocket. They're feeling they might be tightening their belts a little bit. That is, you know, there's there's no way to sugarcoat that. And um, but another way to look at this is the number of folks that are unemployed. Now, looking at the numbers from 2019, we typically tracked about 129,000 folks on the unemployment rolls. That number is now spiked to 470,000 folks that are now categorized as unemployed. So we have literally, there's no way to understate the, the magnitude of these economic losses. The good thing is we have begun to see, turn the corner. The latest jobs report on a national level, level reported 2.5 million jobs. Now, most economists were projecting us losing an additional 2.8 to 3 million jobs. So that is a positive sign of things moving in the right direction. We have turned to corners, as Paul mentioned earlier. I see more people driving and more people are out spending money. I just sense that there's a, a sense of positivity we didn't have a few months ago. And hopefully that translates and you know, will we'll translate into people spending more money jumpstarting this economy again. Now, in terms of how, how many of those jobs, Dallas, those 2.5 million jobs, Dallas is going to uh, capture. The data is not out yet, but I, I guarantee it's going to be quite a few. Um, I'm not, you know, going to make any outlandish projections, but I could see it being with definitely being in the thousands in terms of the number of jobs we'll have gained last month. Um, and that's just due to the fact that we've done such a great job of opening up our economy before everyone else. And I think we're a little bit ahead of the curve right now. Um, so there's, so we're definitely moving, I'd say we're moving in the right direction. And um, we've also seen some clear winners. Speaking of things moving in the right direction, there's other places that really haven't moved in the right, other places that it's really bore the brunt of this and haven't really been able to move in the right direction. Those folks with high concentrations of tourism and energy, for example, have really, their economies have suffered. Folks like um, Detroit, uh, Las Vegas, New York, New Jersey, Honolulu, and even New Orleans um, have really bore the brunt of this along with a place like Oklahoma City and uh, Houston. For example, when we're looking at Detroit, their employment has dropped 25%. I mean, that's that's a tremendous amount. That's, you know, it's unprecedented. And those folks, since they're in a precarious, you know, situation, or even folks that are maybe in a high cost of air, the high cost of area like New York, are going to start looking at places like Dallas as an alternative, as an alternative, because we have strong job growth. We have lower costs of a living and we have lower barriers to entry for businesses as well. So we should fare quite well um, in the next year. So, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the whole concept of sort of real estate being a, a, a hyper local uh, type of, of, of a, an investment, right? I mean, it, you know, the, the, the national numbers are one thing, but really looking, digging deeper into the MSAs and figuring out what things are happening in those MSAs is really important. You know, so we, so Paul, we talked a little bit about sort of, uh, you know, the job market um, and we talked about it from both a local perspective in the Dallas-Fort Worth market and also sort of a macro perspective. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, multifamily pricing, uh, asset pricing. Let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing happening. You know, if we, if we if, again, if we think back sort of um, as I, I like the way Paul thinks about it, you know, if we sort of fell asleep in, in March and we woke up in June, and we're looking around and we looked at our, at our income statements as multifamily owners, we really wouldn't know um, that much, had, much anything different had happened and that there had been a pandemic. So how, how, are, uh, how is asset pricing, in your opinion, going to hold up uh, or is it going to hold up moving forward? What are, yeah. what are, what are things, what is going to happen with the, uh, with the buyers and sellers out there that are looking for multifamily assets right now? Well, in terms of the... Uh you know, when we look at the fundamentals in Dallas-Fort Worth, 
they're still strong. Um, we've actually, we were projecting in 2020 uh, to only absorb a few thousand units. And we've already year to date have had over 7,000 units absorbed. So just in terms of looking at that, the, if the fundamentals or net absorption number translate into pricing and listings, we're in, we're in solid shape. Now, in terms of the listings, we haven't seen a huge dip or spike in listings. And the pricing, the asking prices have held up very well. Uh, in Dallas-Fort Worth, we're seeing that fall right around that value-add investor, about $138,000 to $138, a door. Um, and that's right where we were in January. So, you know, for all the the vulture investments and all these things that people are talking about. I think people are doing their homework. There was a little bit of a pause, but we're starting to see this thaw and money is starting to move into the market. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't really seen a lot of transactions this second quarter. Um, we've only, you know, we're only reporting about 66 million uh, in transactions so far this, this, uh, this quarter compared to Q1, which was 652 million. So things have slowed, but we we are, I'm expecting so a strong- So six, 600 650 million transacted in Q1 and we dropped down to 66 million in Q2. That is incredible. Yeah. Okay. So, but I mean, considering all things considered, um, the fact that anyone was able to make any transaction uh, in the underwriting environment we've been living in is- Quite a miracle to, you know, like, let's call it what it is. So, JC, let's go back to collections. Uh, how's your properties doing right now? Are you uh, able to collect through this uh, this COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, gosh, I mean, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen in March. And we've we've been tracking it uh, every month, like like every other operator out there. And we really haven't seen much of a difference at all. In fact, um, for example, I just pulled the data for June. As of June 5th, um, compared to the trailing average of January through March, which is pre-COVID, and compared to April and May, all on the 5th, so far, as of June 5th, we've collected the most percentage of rents uh, in June than we have for any of the previous months of the whole year. So, I mean, if that gives you an idea of sort of how things have been tracking, I mean, it's it's really better than we could have ever, ever, ever expected. We just did not expect this. And I think that there's a little bit of tempered uh, optimism just because we know that there's a lot of stimulus money, a lot of government money out there, a lot of unemployment benefits that people are collecting right now. And so I think we're really looking towards the, uh, you know, the expiration of those benefits, which I think are slated to go away at the end of July. And then we get to really see sort of what I would call the training wheels come off of the bike. Um, in the form of all the stimulus money. And then we see if the bike is still going to go forward and, and um, is not going to fall down. So I think that, you know, while we have seen a really great collection over the last, uh, you know, three months or that being Q2, um, I think that we're really anxiously awaiting to see what happens uh, once, the, uh, once the stimulus money starts to go away. And, I, and Polly, I think that that really speaks to the idea that the uh, you know, places like Texas, places like Dallas-Fort Worth, which were very aggressive early on and sort of uh, getting back to, um, you know, nor uh, some amount of normalcy uh, post-pandemic here. I think that's really going to go a long way towards sort of bridging the gap between the stimulus money that's been sort of helping us limp along. And then, you know, at some point, you got to be able to stand on your own two feet. And you can only do that um, if you really let the economy get back to what it's been doing. Um, so to me, I mean, the real question is, you know, how well can the economy stand on its own two feet? And I think that Texas as, as a whole and Dallas-Fort Worth in general, because they've started that process so, so much sooner, I think is going to only bode well uh, for the investments out there. I wish I had a, not so much a crystal ball, but uh, a teleporter to go in a year from now and what that would look like uh, a year from today, you know, uh, since we really don't know what's going to happen, you know, I'm, we're just going to make a predictions that uh, that we're going to probably make it through through that. But we're going to be challenged in the next three months. And I can tell you, occupancy uh, in in Texas, uh, you know, you're challenged with occupancy in some of these areas of of uh, it's going to be break, bro broken down by class. So the C C properties, I'm going to pr probably tell you that collections are going to be in the 
80 to 85 percent range on C class properties. B's are going to be maybe a little higher between 85 and 90 percent. The A's, which can, can be deceiving, can be the 90, 92, 93 percent range of scheduled rents. The A's, if, you know, if you're going to throw an A class property that's say a new construction, you know, they're, they're suffering a little bit on the lease up. And there's just so many properties that are you know, trying to come online. And it's been difficulties because all these marketing offices and the, the offices have been closed during this, the last 90 days or so. So, Paul, if I am if I am uh, walking into a cocktail party and I want to be the smartest guy in the room, I want to listen to you. And you're going to tell me three things that I'm going to be able to spit out to somebody that's uh, an apartment investor or just a, you know, a real estate investor. What are the three things that I got to know that makes me look smart like you? Well, the first is uh, everyone wants to know the price of everything. So I definitely throw out that $140,000 a door. Um, you know, that's the first question everyone wants to ask. And I think the second thing I would, 500000 I know that's, a, you know, just 500000 That's a number of government jobs we lost last, last month. And that's one I'm definitely keeping an eye on as we're seeing how these government, the government sector and the universities are going to react to this, this pandemic. And um, the, third, the, fir- the third one I threw out is really that, um, you know, the, the deal volume we had in 2019 was $5.8 billion. Now, when you look at, we t- discussed the, the, you know, the first and second quarters, that when you start heading those numbers up, we have a long way to go to get to that 5.8 billion. But I believe things are turning the corner and we're going to get there by the end of uh, 2020. Well, that's great. Well, you know, Paul Hendershot, we did want to give you a bit of a, of a second to uh, to plug your company. Uh, all you uh, multifamily investors out there that might be listening or, or watching this podcast, um, you know, we're big believers in, in, in not listening to talking heads, uh, but getting your information from cold, hard facts. And uh, CoStar is a leading provider in the world for multifamily data. It's where we go to get our information. Um, Paul, can you just talk a little bit about CoStar and how people can get a hold of you? Yeah, CoStar is the, uh, the, the largest commercial real estate research uh, firm in the world. Uh, the CoStar group uh, owns, we also uh, own apartments.com. Uh, which is an excellent platform to to market uh, properties. And um, if you've seen our our commercials with Jeff Goldblum, they're pretty funny as well. And uh, like I said, we um, you know I think more than ever, it's imperative to take a data driven approach to making your decisions. Um, you know, it's going to get harder and harder to kind of make those. You know, you got to have the instincts and the the guts. But you know, moving forward to having they have as much information as possible as it. Is, is increasingly important. And uh, anyone who wants to get a hold of me, uh, you can just uh, send me an email at phendershot at costar.com. And I'll be more than glad to uh, discuss the market or the, um, you know, uh, looking into using CoStar data. So Paul and I are both pilots and we use data to kind of figure out where the heck we're going. And I wouldn't leave the ground without having specific data. How much gas do I have? What is the speed of my travel? What direction am I going to get to my destination? You know, what's the maintenance on this airplane? And yes. so we we rely upon data to kind of help us. And so I would never leave the ground, as I said, without having to complete. Well, not, not, you're never going to have complete, but you're going to have as, as much current data as possible. And that's where CoStar plays a big role, not only in the data, but also with apartments.com. That's really where they get a lot of their data that comes into their system. And also they have a LoopNet. And if you, you know, uh, want to take a look at LoopNet, take a look at LoopNet. That's kind of the, that's another uh, platform that they, they use. And so, Paul, thanks for spending some time with us. We certainly do appreciate that. Uh, JC, tell me a little bit about what, what you do and how can people get a hold of you? Gosh, well, what we do, Polly, you know, we, we just love to help uh, investors make smart uh, multifamily investment decisions. Um, I mean, it's really the reason why we started this, uh, this podcast as well. I mean, if you're out there and you're listening to the show and you're wondering uh, how to get started in multifamily, if, if you've got some 
important questions. Uh, we've been doing this. I've been doing this for over 14 years. I've been doing this since before the Great Recession. Uh, now this looks like the second recession that we're going to go through. Um, and so, you know, we, we've been there and, and been doing that for a while. We've had, we've had some success and we would be happy to, uh, to listen to you and figure out if there's anything we can do to help you. If you would like to go contact us, you can go to multifamilypropertygroup.com. Again, that's our company, multifamilypropertygroup.com. Go to the contact us pet section and just request a free 50 minute consultation. And I would be happy to get on a 50 minute uh, Zoom call and uh, see how we can help you out. Polly? So JC, yeah, JC's kind of a unique animal because he first started off as an investor, but now he's an operator. So he just happens to have great specific knowledge to help people who also are other investors that want to invest. So they, his group uh, with Eric Cardi and himself at Multifam Group, they invest in hard assets. So if there's ever an opportunity in the future, you want to be on JC's uh, email list to take a look at what he is seeing. So I do encourage you to talk with uh, JC and Eric. And again, uh, I'm Paul Peebles with Old Capital Lending. So if there's ever a lending need when it comes to apartments or office or retail, you always want to contact us at Old Capital Lending. And uh, don't forget the Old Capital Podcast. Uh, uh, download that on, on iTunes, Old Capital Podcast, or on the website, oldcapitalpodcast.com. So Paul Hendershot. Thanks for giving us a little bit of a map in the sky and we would never want to take off without having as much good data as possible. And you guys over at CoStar and yourself have been great stewards of the information. So we definitely appreciate that. And thanks for spending some time with us. On behalf of JC Castillo, I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day.